Peace family, this is Samantha Nisa Yerushalam L, uh, the Vice Chairwoman of National Black United Front, the Northern Virginia chapter. And this is a presentation I am giving for our Sankofa study circle. The name, the name of this class is Introduction to Kwanzaa 101. I want to tell you a little bit more about what Sankofa means because I know some of you are here and I'm just so glad to see everyone. Um, but you're probably wondering what what is this about? What does this mean? So, um, we must look back to the past so that we may understand how we became what we are and move forward to a future. So pretty much it means that you must know your history and you must study the past in order to return to your roots and also not have the past repeat itself. If you've seen some of the mistakes that might, some of the bad things like slavery that happened in the past, you don't want that to be repeated. So you must learn who you are and learn your roots and return back to your roots to make your uh, race and your community stronger um, and to basically have the past, the history not repeat itself if it's, you know, especially if it's, if it's a negative thing. So we're going into the history of Kwanzaa. Uh, Kwanzaa is an African-American and Pan-African holiday which celebrates family, community, and culture. Celebrated from 26 December through 1 January, its origins are in the first harvest celebrations of Africa, from which it takes its name. The name Kwanzaa is derived from the phrase Matunde Ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruits in Swahili, a Pan-African language which is the most widely spoken African language. The first fruits celebrations are recorded in African history as far back as ancient Egypt, and Nubia and appear in ancient and modern times in other classical African civilizations such as Ashanti land and Yoruba land. These celebrations are also found in ancient and modern times among societies as large as empires, the Zulu or kingdoms, Swaziland, or smaller societies and groups like the Matabele, Thunga, and Lavidu all of southeastern Africa. Kwanzaa builds on the five fundamental activities of continental African first fruit celebrations in gathering, reverence, commemoration, recommitment, and celebration. Kwanzaa then is the origins of Kwanzaa, the first fruit celebration, a time of in gathering of the people to reaffirm the, reaffirm the bonds between them, a time of special reverence for the creator and creation and thanks and respect for the blessings, bountifulness and beauty of creation. A time for commemoration of the past in pursuit of its lessons and in honor of its models of human excellence, our ancestors. A time of recommitment to our highest cultural ideas and our ongoing effort to always bring forth the best of African cultural, cultural thought and practice. And a time for celebration of the good, the good of life and of existence itself, the good of family, community and culture, the good of the awesome and the ordinary in a world, in a word, the good of the divine natural and social. The year 2015 will see the 49th annual Kwanzaa, the African-American holiday celebrated from December 26 to January 1st. It is estimated that some 18 million African-Americans take part in Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is not a religious holiday, nor is it meant to replace Christmas. It was created by Dr. Molana Ron Karenga a professor of black studies. In 1966, at this time of great social change for African Americans, Karanga sought to design a celebration that will honor the values of ancient African cultures and inspire African Americans who were working for progress. Why was Kwanzaa created? First, Kwanzaa was created to reaffirm and, and restore our rootedness in African culture. 
It is therefore an expression of recovery and reconstruction of African culture, which was being conducted in the general context of the Black Liberation Movement of the 60s and in the specific context of the organization US, the founding organization of Kwanzaa and the authoritative keeper of its tradition. Secondly, Kwanzaa was created to serve as a regular communal celebration to reaffirm and reinforce the bonds between us as a people. It was designed to be an in-gathering to strengthen community and reaffirm community identity, purpose, and direction as a people and a world community. Thirdly, Kwanzaa was created to introduce and reinforce the Ngoza Saba, the seven principles. These seven communitarian African values are Umoja for unity, Kujichagulia for self-determination, determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujema, cooperative economics, Nia, which means purpose, Kuumba, which means creativity, and Imani, which means faith. This stress on the Nguza Nguzo Saba was at the same time an emphasis on the importance of African communitarian values in general, which stress family, community, and culture, and speak to the best of what it means to be African and human in the fullest sense. And Kwanzaa was conceived as a fundamental and important way to introduce and reinforce these values and cultivate appreciation for them. Kwanzaa is a seven day holiday that begins on December 26th and ends on January 1st of each year. It's a cultural celebration of uh, history, African history, African roots. Uh, it's a celebration that begins to look back in the past, uh, tries to assess who African American people are, uh, how they are connected to a larger world, uh, larger than the, than the United States. It's a holiday that also looks forward, looks in the future, and begins to grapple with the question of where are black people going? But it's also a holiday that begins to embrace other aspects of the national community. It's, it's, it's a celebration that, that's not for black people only, it's a celebration that uh, b that brings diverse groups of people together. Just to give you an example, you can find Kwanzaa in the Smithsonian every year, uh, which is uh, in Washington, D.C., the big museum. You can find Kwanzaa being celebrated um, in Jewish synagogues. You can find Kwanzaa in Unitarian churches across the country. You can find Kwanzaa in a diverse, uh, in a select, uh, uh, group of institutions that you would never think that it would appear and the fact that it occurs right after Christmas gives an opportunity for other groups to speak to what it means to come together at the end of the year now we all do that and it's not to say that African Americans don't celebrate Christmas they are African Americans are lifelong Christians still celebrate Christmas um, much more than they celebrate Kwanzaa but it, it, it at least allows another story to be told about a people's history. And it brings together the national community that's very diverse in the 21st century. So, you know, you have this holiday cornucopia, as I call it. You have Kwanzaa, Christmas, you have Hanukkah, although it sort of rotates. And you, you may even have the Chinese New Year that sometimes is close to the holiday Ramadan. So, again, sometimes close, but uh, Ramadan occurred much earlier in the, in the calendar year this year. And that these holidays have a, not only a, a way of bringing people together, but speaking to other uh, aspects of, of the national community. It was mistaken in the early phase of the holiday's history as being something that was sort of based on African religion, based on that it was anti-Christian in, in certain ways. and. Uh, those were myths. It was meant to reconnect African Americans back to a cultural base, and that cultural base being uh, uh, Africa, the continent of Africa. Now we're going into the seven principles of Kwanzaa. Each of the seven days of Kwanzaa honors a different principle. These principles are believed to have been key to building strong, productive families and communities in Africa. During Kwanzaa, cel celebrants greet each other with Abarikani or what's the news? The principles of Kwanzaa form the answers. 
The seven principles of Kwanzaa are Umoja, which means unity. Its action is building community and community that holds together. The second day, you would celebrate Kujitagalia, which means self-determination. Um, this action is speaking for yourself and making choices that benefit the community. The third day, you would celebrate Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. This action would be helping others within the community. The fourth day, you would be celebrating Ujama, which means cooperative economics. And this action is supporting businesses that care about the community. The fifth day, you would be celebrating Nia, which means a sense of purpose. The action is setting goals that benefit the community. The sixth day, you would celebrate Kaumba, which means creativity, and the action meaning making the community better and more beautiful. And the last day, you would celebrate Imani, which means faith. Action is believing that a better world can be created for communities now and in the future. The three colors of Kwanzaa, red, black, and green, and their significance. Families gather for the great feast of Karuma on December 31st. Karamu may be held at a home, community center, or church. Celebrants enjoy traditional African dishes as well as those featuring ingredients Africans brought to the United States, such as sesame seeds, binet, peanuts, ground nuts, sweet potatoes, collard greens, and spicy sauces. Especially at Karamu, Kwanzaa is celebrated with red, black, and green. These three colors were important symbols in ancient Africa that gained new recognition through the efforts of Marcus Garvey's Black Nationalist Movement. Green is for the fertile land of Africa, black is for the color of the people, and red is, the, is for the blood that is shed in the struggle for freedom. Some of the decorations of Kwanzaa. Celebrants decorate with red, black, and green, as well as African-style textiles and art. The seven symbols of Kwanzaa, which is a little bit different from the seven principles. So the seven symbols of Kwanzaa are what you would use to decorate what they call a set. And we'll see later in this film what a set is. Um, so the first symbol is Kikumbe Sha Umoja, Umoja, which is the unity cup. Um, the celebrants drink from this cup in honor of their African ancestors. Before drinking, each person says Harambe or let's pull together. The second symbol of Kwanzaa is the Kanara, the candle holder which holds seven candles. This, this symbol is said to symbolize, I mean, this, this object is said to symbolize stalks of corn that branch off to form new stalks, much as the human family is created. The third symbol of Kwanzaa is Mazao, maza, um, is the meaning of the fruits, nuts, and vegetables. The action is to remind celebrants of the harvest fruits that nourish the people of Africa. The fourth symbol is Mashuma Saba, which are the seven candles that represent the seven principles. A different candle is lit each day. Three candles on the left are green, three on the right are red, and in the middle is a is a single black candle. The fifth symbol is Mkeka, which is the mat. Um, the symbols of Kwanzaa are arranged on the Mkeka, which may be made of straw or African cloth. It symbolizes the foundation upon which communities are built. The sixth symbol is Vibunze, which is plural uh, or Mihundi. This is the ear of corn. And this action is traditionally one ear of corn is placed on the Mkeka for each child present. And the last symbol of Kwanzaa is Zawadi, which are the gifts. Um, traditionally, educational and cultural gifts are given to children on January 1st, the last day of Kwanzaa. All right, so how's everybody doing today? I'm all right. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I couldn't hook up to the TV here because I have a PowerPoint presentation that I wanted you to see. And um, so I'm just going to have to go over the information to you. But I have a couple of video clips, but you'll be able to hear them. So I have uh, speakers here, speakers I always travel with. So I have a couple of important uh, video clips as well that I want you to uh, uh, 
experience, okay? So, uh, how have you been enjoying the Code Red Detroit seminar so far? Powerful. The powerful? Powerful, yeah. Okay, good, good. So, hopefully this uh, presentation will help uh, to cap everything and maybe uh, reinforce some things that were talked about today. I did a lecture yesterday, uh, it was about a four and a half hour lecture. Uh, it was um, Chief African American Celebrate European Holidays, the history of Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter. Okay, so, okay, so I did that at the 5E Gallery uh, on Cass and Forest Street in Detroit. People know it as the old red door, yeah, Piper Carter. Um, so, very quickly here, my name is Mike Limhotep, I'm the host of the African History Network show, president of the African History Network. Uh, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, the presentation I'm doing today is what is Kwanzaa, okay? Kwanzaa is coming up December 26th. A lot of people may have heard of it, some people may have celebrated it, other people may say what is Kwanzaa, why do we need this, blah, blah, blah. All right, so that's what I'm going to deal with today. Uh, you can listen to my show every Thursday, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have listeners around the world. I just got an email from a brother uh, in, in China who is from the UK and he's going to the University of Beijing and he told me that you have listeners in Sudan and Uganda okay. listening to your show. Okay, so we have listeners all across the country, uh, around the world, and then also on our YouTube channel, um, we have over 12,600 subscribers on our YouTube channel, about 570 video clips there dealing with African history and African American history. Uh, my website is theafricanhistorynetwork.com theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can go there, connect you to everything. Our Twitter page, Facebook, uh, we have DVDs there, over uh, 100 different titles. Connects you to our YouTube channel as well. And gives you information about our show, the African History Network show, as well as the show I do on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. to, uh, it's supposed to be 11 p.m., but we've been going to 12 and 12.30 uh, in the morning. So how many, people, how many people have seen the documentaries, Hidden Colors 1 and 2? How many people are familiar with that? Okay, so in Hidden Colors 1 and 2, you see a brother named Booker T. Coleman in there. Okay, that's one of my teachers. Uh, he, he's known as Kaba Hiawatha, common name. We do a show every Wednesday, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, called the Per Ankh Hour Questions and Answers Show. And Per Ankh means the house of life in the ancient Kemetic language or Egyptian language of the middle net or what the Greeks call the hieroglyphics. So be sure to visit our table back there. We have information. All the DVDs are on sale. I have about 13 of my DVD lectures as well, because I do lectures. I'm a talk show host. I do research. So a lot of that stuff's on sale. All right, now we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, this past Thursday, I just had Warren Ballantyne on the show also. We talked about the Code Red seminar. I also interviewed Tony Browder. How many people are familiar with Tony Browder? Tony Browder is one of our brilliant scholars. He's an archaeologist, a historian. Uh, he's in the documentary Hidden Colors 2, The Triumph of Melanin. And Hidden Colors 1 and 2 are two of the best documentaries you ever see dealing with our history. They deal with thousands of years of our history. But Tony is also the author of the book Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, okay, Ex uh, Exploding the Myths. I recommend that book to everybody because he deals with thousands of years of history, African history, European history, everything. And it's very easy to understand. You don't need a PhD in archaeology, African American studies, or anything like that to be able to understand this book. So now Valley Contributions to Civilization. All right, uh, and then also, as uh, David mentioned, uh, I, I do a reoccurring segment on Angelo Henderson's show on WCHB 1200 AM. Usually I'm on every other Friday, uh, 10, 11.30 AM, noon, something like that, uh, depending upon the segment, okay? But uh, look out for me there as well, WCHB 1200 AM. All right, now, anytime I do a presentation, I know I'm gonna say some things that people may have never heard before, I may say some things people don't agree with, I may say some things people don't like, okay? But it's not my intent to offend anybody. I deal with facts and evidence. Uh, so I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens, from the African Village out of St. Louis. So anytime I do a presentation, I usually have people put their fingers together to form a circle. I usually say something like this. Uh, the space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge. Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. Now the reason why I say that is because oftentimes when people hear something that contradicts what they've been taught, what they believe, or what they think they know, they automatically reject it without doing any research to determine the validity of the new information that they're learning. And at the same time, they usually don't use that same level of scrutiny to analyze, critique, or reevaluate what it is they think they know or what they believe. 
So just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything that is to know about what you know. There's still things outside of the circumference of your own awareness. Uh -huh. Okay, everybody understand? Yes. Okay, it's like when I ask people, I know people are from different uh, religious backgrounds, people are from different um, uh, levels of understanding when it comes to history, archeology, span anthropology, things of this nature. But for instance, if I ask people, uh, what was Adam's first wife's name? Usually people are confused because they haven't studied it. But if you go look up Lilith, you'll see that this was Adam's first wife's name. But you have to do some research. Okay, so that's just something outside the circumference of your own awareness, just something to throw out at you. All right, now, um, why is studying African history important? Every ethnic group in America has their history and culture intact for the most part, their language, uh, knowledge of self, things of this nature. But one of our great scholar warriors, Renoko Rashidi, uh, I've interviewed him, I think five or six times. He's in Hidden Colors 2, he's a prolific author. One of his most recent books, uh, Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe, he deals with the presence of African people going back hundreds of years, even before the Moors go in in 711 AD, 8th century. Uh, but He's been to 103 countries and islands around the world, okay? He's a world traveler. He takes pictures wherever he goes to document the African presence around the world. He has a personal library of approximately 25,000 photographs he's taken around the world. African people in Australia, Dominican Republic, Brazil, everywhere, India, all around the world. But he has a saying, and uh, I, I modified it some, but what you, when this capsulizes why African history and culture are so important. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so as Dr. Wade Nobles, another one of my great scholar warriors says, power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own, all right? So this is what happens when the people don't know who they are. They are, we've been taught to see reality through the eyes of Europeans, okay? And uh, self-determination to a large extent has been taken away because we don't understand how to define reality for ourselves. So this is one of the reasons why the history and culture are so important. Uh, very briefly, to, so we can understand the importance of culture before we really start talking about Kwanzaa, which is a cultural holiday. Uh, how many people are familiar with Dr. Leonard Jeffries? Dr. Jeffries, one of our great scholar warriors, another one of my teachers, I've interviewed him 14 times on my show. We just had him on Your Voice with Angelo Henderson, November 1st, if I remember correctly. We were dealing with the six-part documentary from Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., or as he calls him, Dr. Henry Louis Skipper Truth Gates. Uh, but right. he, he has a uh, six-part documentary called The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, aired on PBS, yeah, uh, six and second of Tuesdays. How many people saw that? Some Okay. So uh, we were dealing specifically with episode one and some of the historical inaccuracies in episode one. Like, for instance, he talks about the first known African coming in 1513, Juan Garrido, who was a black conquistador, <coughs> but he didn't talk about the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years and it's been documented, okay? He, he didn't deal with that, that African people are the indigenous people to this land. And if you read the book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence by uh, Dr. David M. Hotel, no relation to me, he's not my father or anything like that. Uh, he, he has 713 footnotes and seven peer-reviewed articles thoroughly documenting the African presence in this country in the, um, uh, in the territory that they know as South Carolina, Allendale County, South Carolina, 51,700 years ago, and in um, South America, 56,000 years ago. Okay, so these are things that we have to reclaim. But Dr. Jeffries, when he teaches, he talks about the pyramid principle. And usually, I saw a picture of the pyramid of Khafre with the Sphinx or Her Aket in front of it, because that's the Sphinx is an Arabic term, that's not what we call it. Her em, her em Aket, meaning Heru on the horizons. But when you look at a pyramid, it has three sides, right? A triangle, three sides. Mm -hmm. The foundation is African history and culture, okay? This gives you your foundation, your roots. The two sides of the pyramid are economic empowerment and political empowerment. If that foundation is not there, it does not matter how much money you have, you will not know what to do with it and you will not be able to control it. 
So this is why the gross domestic product for African Americans right now is approximately one trillion dollars and 98% of our dollars are spent with people that don't look like us. 95% with European Americans, 3% with other ethnic groups, okay? Because that foundation is not intact. And if you don't control the economic empowerment, it's impossible for you to control the political empowerment because politics does not operate without money, okay? You cannot hold your politicians accountable if you don't control your dollars, okay? so. Uh, so this is why this is extremely important. And, and Dr. Jeffries talks about a systems analysis versus a paralysis of analysis. All right, now, very quickly, to understand what culture is, because it's been taken away from us for the most part during the uh, colonization, the transatlantic slave uh, uh, system, the great Ma'afa, the great disaster, things of this nature. So culture deals with the traditions, spiritual systems, art, music, dance, folklore, mythology, cosmology, language, educational system, etc. Cosmology deals with the study of the universe as an orderly system, okay? Uh, and you study, when you study African um, history, African culture, you see that we have some very con complex cosmology, especially when you look at ancient Kemet, or what Arabs call Egypt, because that's not what we call it. That's an Arabic word for Greek derivation, okay? Kemet, means land of the blacks. You also see top Mary, meaning the, uh, the beloved land. Okay, uh, now culture acts as an immune system, which keeps foreign elements from coming in and attacking you. And Dr. Marima Ani, one of our great female scholar warriors, talks about this, what culture is and how it acts as this immune system, okay? She's also the author of a book that took her about 20 years to write. I think it's, I think that book is about maybe seven, 800 pages. Uh, Yoruba. An African-centered critique of European cultural thought and behavior. Okay, why you, are you, G U. Yoruba. That's a Dogon word, if I remember correctly. Dogon money. Dogon of Mali. Why you, are you, G U. Yoruba. Okay. Now, culture is the glue or cohesiveness that binds the people together and tells them that the only way that they're going to survive and prosper is by self-reliance and working together. This is what culture does. This is why when people talk about we need unity and they talk about every other ethnic group or they talk about Jews and things like this, what they're really talking about is culture. I never talk about unity. We need unity, all this stuff. I never talk about that. I deal with culture and history. And this is why that's the foundation of that pyramid, okay? Very simple. All right, now, when we look at Kwanzaa, now that we have some type of foundation laid, all right? And let me just explain to people, it takes a lot of time to put together presentations. The one I did yesterday, that was the culmination of three years of research I've been doing on the uh, origins of uh, all the uh, holidays. I've done shows dealing with the origins of uh, Friday the 13th and Frigatruska Decophobia, which is the fear of Friday the 13th and where this comes from. Uh, the uh, origins of Easter and uh, Valentine's Day coming from the festival of Lupercalia, which is an ancient uh, wolf festival uh, amongst Romans and things of this nature. So uh, the three main reasons why I do presentations, because I don't do this for the money. It takes money to do this, but I don't do this for the money. Uh, my degree is in business administration from Wayne State University. Number one, I tell people don't take my word for this. Go do your own research. Number one, I do these presentations to make you think. If I can make you think, you start asking questions. If you start asking questions, you start seeking out answers. Number two, to provide you with the information, the resources, the books, the websites, the articles, the video clips, et cetera, for you to go do your own research. Proper documentation ends all conversation. This is why I don't do any debate. Number three, we can sum up in two words why we do the research. People like myself, uh, Brother Kaba Kamene, Booker T. Coleman, Dr. Linda Jeffries, et cetera. We can sum it up in two words, behavior modification. Right now it's correct wrong behavior. So this information has to transform you and ultimately transform your behavior. If you read Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Ecker, which is a fantastic book, and when I teach entrepreneurship, I reference that book, he talks about the process of manifestation. The process of manifestation states that your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Once again, your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. So when you have people who can control the circumference of your own awareness, not only can they uh, influence your actions, they can predict your actions. Okay, this is why a lot of our reactions to a lot of things that happen, happens is to march. And I talk about how we suffer from March Madness. We get mad and we want to march because our <laughs> circumference of awareness is being shaped by those who are in power, the 1%. And, uh, well, I'm not going to call any names, but uh, we'll, we'll continue. Okay, but this is what happens, all right? 
All right, now, when we look at Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa is a African-American, pan-African cultural holiday, not a religious holiday, cultural holiday that celebrates family, community, and culture. It's celebrated from December 26th to January the 1st, okay? Very important. Now, the name Kwanzaa comes from the Kiswahili phrase. Some people call it Swahili, but the actual term is Kiswahili. The Kiswahili phrase, Matunda Ya Kwanzaa, which means first fruits, okay? Kiswahili is the most widely spoken language on the continent of Africa. So when you watch Hidden Colors 1, uh, Professor Kaba Kamane or Booker T. Coleman at the end, when they deal with solutions to our issues and problems. And we only have two main problems. When you understand history, when you understand what happened when Columbus opened up the New World when he uh, set sail August 3rd, 1492, you understand the Moors losing control of uh, the last uh, stronghold in uh, Spain, which was Grenada, January 2nd, 1492. We only have two problems. Everything else was simple. Number one, European white supremacy and racism. We don't understand what it is and how it works. Number two, we've been stripped of African history and culture. Everything else comes from those two root problems, period. Everything else, teenage pregnancy, drug addiction, lack of jobs, everything emanates from those two root problems. Which All right. are, yeah. European white supremacy and racism and us not understanding what it is and how it works. And as Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, author of the uh, ISIS papers, and Dr. Nelly Fuller tell us accurately, if you do not understand European white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you, period. Everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you. Okay, so, um, at the, it, towards the end of Hidden Colors, Dr. Um, uh, Professor Akaba Kamene talks about how we all need to learn Kiswahili because it's the most widely spoken language on the continent of Africa. So if somebody from Detroit meets somebody from Ghana, or somebody from Detroit meets somebody from Kenya, they can speak to one another using Kiswahili. So it was very important. All right, now, Kwanzaa was created in 1966, co-created co by Dr. Moalana Karenda, who is a uh, professor and chair of the Africana Studies Department at California State University in Long Beach, and also the organization US. He was a co-founder of this organization, and they uh, co-created this uh, celebration in 1966. It comes out of uh, the Black Liberation Movement, some people say the Black Freedom Movement of the 1960s, and it reflects a concern for cultural groundedness in thought and practice, all right? Now, some sources will say that he created Kwanzaa, but when you look at other sources coming from us, and you look at his actual official website, you'll see that, well, I've actually read some articles where he say he, where he as he says, it, he was a co-creator of it, because he also gives credit to uh, other members of the organization, us as well, all right? Just like how uh, a lot of times we say that um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915. He was a co-founder. There were four other co-founders along with him. So we need to honor those, those people as well, even though we may not know their names. All right, now, Kwanzaa was created to serve multiple purposes and to address specific problems that African people were dealing with back, uh, back at this time, and they still relate to today, all right? Now, when, um, to understand Kwanzaa, we need to understand what are first fruits celebrations, first fruit celebrations, because a lot of people say he just made up these traditions, things like this, but they have their whole in uh, East African countries in, in, in first fruit celebrations, okay? Now, first fruit celebrations have taken place in African history going back to uh, ancient Egypt or Kemet, the land of the blacks, and as well as uh, Nubia. Now, Nubia is a Greek word when the indigenous terms was ta Nehesi or ta Seti. ta Seti meaning land of the bow, because these were some fierce archers, okay? Uh, and you also, just like Ethiopia, just so people know Ethiopia is a Greek word, okay, it means sunburn, re re referring to the complexion of these people, because these are some black African people. If anybody is ever confused, ancient Egyptians were not brown-skinned Europeans or Europeans were tans. These were black African people. And the further back in history you go, the blacker they get. All right, now, um, first fruit celebrations occur in ancient and modern African civilizations, such as among the Ashanti of Ghana and the Yoruba of Nigeria. Uh, we can also find first fruit celebrations in large African empires like amongst the Zulu, or correctly the Amazulu of uh, South Africa, or uh, a Zania, a Zania Mawini Mutapa, is what is properly known as. Um, and also smaller societies in southeastern Africa like uh, uh, Matabele, 
as well, okay? Uh, and also, just for the sake of accuracy, and to clear any myths, Africa was not named after Scipio Africanus, a Roman general, okay? That's a myth, and I did a presentation, uh, presentation I did last February. She had African Americans celebrate uh, Black History Month, exposing the myth. So I deal with the whole history of Black History Month, why it was created, because a lot of people don't know the history of Black History Month and why it was created. And this is not something the Europeans gave us. It's something Dr. Carter G. Woodson created because he realized that we didn't know our history. And um, I dealt with um, Scipio Africanus. So just briefly, to, so we can dispel this myth, I don't have time to deal with the uh, Willie Lynch being a fraud and a fake and never historically just don't have time to get to that. Um, but um, first of all, when you look at, have you all heard that Africa's name after Scipio Africanus, Roman general? Okay. Have you heard that? All right, first of all, just very, very briefly. When you study Publius Cornelius Scipio, and you study his family, his family's last name was not Africanus, number one. Number two, Africanus in Latin means belonging to Africa or of Africa. Don't take my word for it. Get the uh, Casales Latin English Dictionary, page 11, right-hand side in the entry for a fear, A-F-E-R, and it breaks down Africa and what it means. Also, if you go to answers.com and type in uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio, it tells you that he took his name, the surname, Africanus, after the name of the territory that he conquered, which means it was already called Africa. So it was not named after him. So we can prove this historically and linguistically. And we get we just look at what his family's last name was also it was not Africanus. But once again, this is a myth. When people don't have proper information. And the internet allows you to miseducate or educate millions of people with a few clicks. This is a myth that, that spreads with it. So this is why we have to uh, dispel the myths. This is why I say proper documentation ends all conversation. All right, now, three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Y'all all right? Yeah. Okay, you learn anything? Oh, yeah. Staying awake? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and I had to change my presentation some because I can't show it to you because I got a lot to show, I can't show it to you, so I just have to go over this. Now, three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Okay, number one, Kwanzaa was created to reaffirm and restore our rootedness in African culture which we have been stripped of for the most part during the Great Ma'afa or the Great Disaster, the Ma'afa meaning the Great Disaster, which is the transatlantic slave trade. Now, just so people understand, um, when you look at, uh, Professor Kaba Kamene has done extensive research at the uh, Schomburg Institute, and, he, and he's uh, examined the transatlantic slave trade and the number of slaves coming here. At the most, only 1.4 million Africans came here as slaves, at the most. You already had millions of African people in North, Central, and South America before Europeans come here, um, and you're going to have the you're going to have Asians coming in about 3,000 BC. These Asians and Africans are going to intermix, and the offspring are what we call Native Americans. We have to understand who the Native Americans are. We have to understand that we are the original indigenous people to this land. So when we look at Thanksgiving, because oftentimes we talk to see Thanksgiving through the eyes of Europeans, or we talk about what they did to the Native Americans. Well, wait a second. The Native Americans are a mixture of African people, and you're going to have some quote unquote Native American tribes that were all African people or quote unquote black Indians. Okay, so it's important for us to understand this. Uh, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, who's an expert on the history of the Moors, and he taught, uh, a cla he taught classes on the history of the Moors at Temple University. Uh, I've interviewed him. He's one of my first interviews I did back in 2010. He talks about how if you do not know the names that your people have had throughout history, you will, know, you will not know how to find yourself in history. You're looking for black or Negro and don't know Phoenicians were African people. You're looking for black and Negro or colored and don't know Carthaginians were African people, okay? You're looking, you, you don't know that uh, Brazil is 52% African or mulatto. The population of Brazil, they have the largest, Brazil has the largest population of people of African descent outside the continent of Africa. They have over 100 million people of African descent in Brazil. But when you look at the travel channel, the history channel, travel brochures, they show you the descendants of the Portuguese to hide this from you. Right. Because if you, saw, if you saw African people there, and then if you actually learn that African people were the first people in South America going back 56,000 years ago, then all this would totally start to, dis to, totally start to dispel and destroy European white supremacy. Okay? Because European white supremacy is based upon a myth. And the only way it really has the most power is if you actually believe it. Right. Okay, if you don't believe it, okay, before we wrap up, I want to make sure I get through this, okay? But, uh, how are we doing on time? Where's David? 
Because before we go, let me be sure to remind me to explain to you how European white supremacy is like the Wizard of Oz. Okay? All right. You control the time, brother. All right, now. All right, now. Uh, Kwanzaa is an expression of, re of, of recovery and reconstruction of African culture. This is a process that was uh, taking place in various degrees during the uh, Black Liberation Movement, Black Freedom Movements of the 1960s, uh, with groups like uh, the organization Us, uh, which was co-founded by Dr. Um, uh, Moana Kareda. Now, number two, we're dealing with three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. So number one, we have to reaffirm and restore rootedness in African culture. Number two, Kwanzaa was created to serve as a regular communal celebration to reaffirm and reinforce the bonds between us as a people, okay, between African between African people. So it reconnects us to the community, and this is why it's also good to go to community celebrations of Kwanzaa. Um, at the Charles H. Wright Museum, you can uh, check their website, because the Shrine of the Black Madonna, they, they usually have a really good celebration. Uh, I'm speaking, uh, I'm speaking a bunch of them, so let's see, the 27th, uh, Malcolm X Grassroots uh, uh, Movement, uh, they're doing one that is at the 5E Gallery. I'm speaking there. And then just go to my website because I'm going to have them listed because I'm, I'm speaking at a few different ones. I can't remember all of them now. But it's good to go to a, a community Kwanzaa event because then you get the input of a lot of people. You feel the energy of the people. You feel the bonding of the people as well in the community. All right, now, Kwanzaa was designed to be an in-gathering, which means a coming together yes. to strengthen community and reaffirm community identity, purpose, and direction as a people and a world community. All right, very important to reaffirm common identity, who we are, okay? Some people are confused about who we are. Suge Knight just said he'd rather be called an N-word than African-American. Mm. See, it's people like that that maybe wish birth control was retroactive. No, oh, that's right. Okay, but Suge Knight, Suge Knight who has access to the media, Okay, who influences, whose music has influenced. You know, Suge Knight put, uh, help, help uh, uh, expose uh, uh, Tupac. Uh, Tupac, people already knew Tupac before, before Suge Knight, but he helped expose uh, Dr. Dre and, and, and Snoop Dogg, things like this. And this Negro says something like that. All right? Work for the FBI. Makes me, makes me think they got the wrong person when Tupac died. All right. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that. Okay. Now, um, okay, let's continue. Number three. Three, number three, three main reasons why Kwanzaa was created. Kwanzaa was created to introduce and reinforce the Nguzu Saba, which, which yeah. means the seven principles, okay? These, these, are, uh, these are seven African communitarian uh, principles. Now, the seven principles are number one, umoja, which means unity, okay? And these are Kiswahili terms, umoja, which means unity. Uh, Kuji Chagalia, which means self-determination. Can you say Kuji Chagalia? Kuji Chagalia. Okay, so it means self-determination. Uh, Ujima which means collective work and responsibility. Okay, can you see Ujima? Ujima. Ujima. All right, now a lot of people are familiar with Ujima because the episode of Sanford and Son entitled uh, uh, Lamont Goes African, he told uh, Fred, he said, we're gonna have some Ujima in this house. Hmm. And Fred uh, said to Bubba, he said, Bubba, you ever heard of Ujima? And Bubba said, I heard of Big Jima, but I never heard of Ujima. <laughs> so we've all heard of Ujima before. We just didn't know, okay? All right, now. Uh, number four is Ujama. Ujama means cooperative economics. Can you say Ujama? Ujama. All right. And uh, number five is Nia, which Nia. means purpose. Nia. 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 Uh, number six is Kuumba. Can you say Kuumba? Kuumba means creativity. And uh, number seven is Imani, which means faith. Can you say Imani? Imani. Imani. We all know Imani because we probably all know somebody named Imani. All right. Now, when we break down the principles, Umoja, which means unity. Uh, it means to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race, okay? And uh, a lot of people want to convince us we're in post-racial America. No, you, no we aren't, <laughs> okay? Just, just so people understand. Um, Kuji Chagalia self-determination means to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. This, this doesn't mean the chosen leaders chosen by other people who are trying to suppress you. This means leaders coming from the community that, who are accountable to you and African people being able to speak for themselves. But to speak for ourselves, we have to have our own media. This is why the Empowerment Network is so important. This is why Radio One is so important. My network, the African History Network on Blog Talk Radio, this is why it's so important because if you can't communicate to your people, then you are at a real disadvantage, okay? Uh, Ujima, cooperative economics, means to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and businesses, and to profit from them together. 
okay? Uh, Nia, purpose, means to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness, okay? One of the things, you know, I started studying back at Wayne State uh, over 20 years ago, not probably about 22 years ago. I started about 1992 when um, Malcolm X movie came out. The movie changed my life and I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I call that book The Black Man's Eyeglasses because it, it'll help you see things more clearly. That is a powerful book. How many people, how many people have read the autobiography of Malcolm X? That's a powerful book. Another important book I, I encourage people to read is by James H. Cohn. It's called Martin Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare. Okay? In this book, he, he deals with uh, passages and excerpts from their speeches, and he shows how the, how the end of both their lives, their ideologies were converging, and they were starting to think alike. Okay, so this was this was like really powerful. Um, okay, now we have uh, let's see, Kumba creativity to do to do always as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. All right. And when we go back to create this uh, uh, need a purpose from our traditional greatness, um, you know, one of the things I was trying to find out is how do we go from pyramids to projects? How do we go from ruling the world to being under the foot of people who learn from us? And when you, when you find, when you actually study, you know, the, the missing link that I found, uh, I read uh, Black Man of the Nile and His Family by Dr. Yosef Ben Yakin, one of our great early pioneers in the study of African history and one, probably one of the first um, archaeologists or, or Egyptologists of African descent. He's an Egyptologist. Um, when you study the history of the Moors, these black African people called Moors, and, and any time somebody tries to tell me, well, the Moors are white, you all are lying, I ask them to please go study the etymological derivation of the word Moor. And usually I don't hear back from them because it's, it's, dealing with, it's dealing with us, the majority of them. But the Moors going in into Europe and saving Europe uh, because when they go in, 90, about 90% of Europeans are illiterate, okay? You had kings and queens who couldn't read and write. They don't have a sanitation system. They aren't taking baths, things like this. They've lost the concept of longitude or latitude. The Moors introduced all this to them. They introduced technology, science, mathematics. And it, it was the, these Africans known as Moors who actually saved Europe. If it had not been for the Moors, the bubonic plague they hit in 1347 and then spurts up until 1400, which wiped out somewhere between 25 to 75 million Europeans, it would have wiped them all out if it hadn't been for what the Moors introduced to them. You know, so, um, personally, you know, I, I wish we never talked them, but that's, that's just me understanding history, okay? And what happened when the Moors started being enslaved and killed off, but you know, just understand the person, I just, I just wish we never talked them. There's nothing personal, it's just understanding history. Um, then we have Kuumba, creativity to, um, no, I just did that. Imani, faith, to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents and teachers, our leaders, and the righteousness and, and the victory of our struggle. Okay, so those are the Nguzu Saba and what they mean. We have the, the names and what they mean in English and Kiswahili. All right, now, uh, the Nguzu Saba, or seven principles, uh, focus on the importance of African communitarian values in general, which stress family, community, and culture, and speak to the best of what it means to be African and the first people. Uh Brother Michael Imhotep talked about in his video, we, um, I wanted to put these slides just so that we can understand which um, principle is to be celebrated on each day. So for day one, uh, there's emoja, which means unity, and is to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and the race. And I also wanted to include the symbol, these Adinkra symbols, so that you will recognize symbols are very, very, very important. My sons were like toddlers, and they already knew McDonald's before they even could say read because they saw the symbol. So symbols are extremely important. Um, usually when I will give my lectures or give a class, I'm going to always put the symbols next to the words because um, our, that, that's, that was our language. Like, um, so day two, hold on a second. Yes, day two we have 
Kuji Chagalia. I love saying that word. <laughs> Even though I get tongue tied sometimes. Um, it means self determination and is to define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. Uh, the next uh, symbol, or the next, or for day three, you'll be celebrating Ujima, and that's collective work and responsibility. And it says to build and maintain our community together and make our sisters and brothers' problems our problems and to solve them together. So a great example of this is what we're doing today. Um, when you come together as a community as a col and do collective works and take the, the responsibility to do these things and work with your brothers and sisters, that's what Ujima is. Um, and that, that one to kind of segue that into you know, you don't have to wait for Kwanzaa to do these principles. Kwanzaa is, a, is, a, is an amazing time of the year where you can spend time with your loved ones and your friends, but you are also learning something that's extremely imperative for our race, for us to continue to practice throughout the year. So you don't need to wait for Kwanzaa to practice giving back to the community. You can do it every single day any time of the year um and but it's important to do it you know just get out and do it you don't have to wait for a special time to to do that for your community um day four of kwanzaa you'll be celebrating ujima and that's cooperative economics this is actually my favorite one just because i know how important it is for um black people to have an economy um and I know that you, we can't do it alone. Um, you, like you've seen people who have a ton of money, like Michael Jackson, Prince, um, even Bill Cosby, who they have a lot of money and then people may equate that to power, but they really don't have the power because we as Africans or we're a village, we're supposed to be a tribe and work together. You know, also going back to Ujima, it's the cooperative economics is it says to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses, and to profit from them together. So, you know, if you if you have a business, and I'm gonna tell you right now, majority of times a non-black person is or you know group of people, they're not going to patronize your business. They're not gonna they're not gonna frequent. They're not gonna go to your restaurants. They're not gonna go to your stores. Um, and they're not going to buy from you. You know why? Because they're practicing cooperative, cooperative, their own cooperative economics. They usually are shopping with each other. And that's why you have the Chinatowns of the world. You have Little Italy. You have um, communities where you see a lot of Arabs. Um, you have, I've lived in, I live in a community now where it's predominantly uh, Arabics living here. And then, or Arabs, I'm sorry. And then I also, when I lived in Arizona, there was this, you know, I lived like right outside my base. I was stationed there. It looked like a little, I used to joke and say, this is little Mexico. Like I really didn't understand because this was year, many years ago. I was like 18, 19, going to my first duty station. But looking back now, I'm like, wow, like they had flea markets and it didn't even have a building. It was just outside. They would just set up tables and they would sell, sell their, their goods. And they would all come and shop with each other. They weren't going to Walmart. They weren't going... And I'm not saying they don't go to Walmart because they, they, I do see them at Walmart too, but it wasn't nearly as many as I saw at this flea market that day because I just happened to go there. And I mean, I'm going to keep it 100. They were looking at me and my friends like we didn't belong there and why were we there? Because <laughs> we didn't know, you know, I wasn't awakened. I didn't, I wasn't conscious. I was just in the military, just experiencing different cultures and the ways of life and I, I always liked was interested in learning about other cultures and so we were just exploring you know this is my first time being kind of like near the west coast I'm an east coast girl and I was just exploring what was around me and they were looking like we didn't belong there and it's funny because they probably really felt that way and they didn't and I they didn't need us they had each other um to purchase things from you know and of course for me I would say don't turn away any dollars but sometimes you do have to be careful who you're getting your money from because sometimes people the people that give you the money they want to help control you know whatever so that's why you don't want to be dependent on people outside of your community because 
now if they are 90% of your customer base um, clientele then they're gonna start to want to call the shots because they're gonna be like we without us you wouldn't even be in business without us you wouldn't even be able to keep your doors open so we want to have a say in what you sell or, or how you do business or what you you donate where you donate your your money or you know so on and so forth so so day five you would be celebrating Nia which means purpose and this is to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness and it's pretty self-explanatory Nia is just saying you need to find purpose um, and collectively you, you see that word continues to come up because it's about us being a tribe it's about us working together doesn't matter your gender men women you need to be black and loving your brothers and sisters and working together we, we cannot do it without the other one and so purpose is saying coming together and finding that purpose like what are we working towards what are we uh doing to build um and develop a community that is sustainable and not falling apart and not in poverty and doesn't have bad schools you know what are we doing what is our purpose and a lot of times black people come together and they don't have any real idea of what we should be working towards and i always tell people i always tell people because i was talking to someone on the phone about creating a group a new and like a new group and i always tell people before you can and he he mentioned something about standards and i i wanted to i told him you know i was like before we can have standards we must have goals if you don't have goals you don't have you don't know what direction you're moving in you don't know where you're headed um so it's like if you, you people always are kind of based on these rules they always want to jump right into telling you what you can't and can't do can and can't do um, or how you're going to do something but they don't a lot of times I'm finding that a lot of people don't really have a, a goal they don't have they don't know what the mission even is and as a black race our goal right now should be black economic empowerment you know making sure we're building businesses we're teaching our children how to be entrepreneurs we're hiring black people not anyone else we're shopping with black people not anyone else and be unapologetic about it you know I know it sounds People are going to say, oh, it sounds mean, but it's not really about being nice or mean at the end of the day. It's business. It's about survival. It's about, you know, our money always going out of our communities and us not being able to provide for our families. Like, So you're telling me it's mean to not shop with a small black business owner who's depending on your patronage versus you going running off to Walmart who's not depending on you at all. actions speak louder than words like you walking away turning your back on your own who you know is the most oppressed race in the world and you walking away from them and feeling like it's okay to shop with someone else I think that's meaner to not look after the people who actually need that money not the people who just are greedy and is you know they're doing whatever to keep making making their money and they they're not and then on top of that they're not going to get back but we need to know what our purpose is as a black community stop wandering around aimlessly and having no real idea of what our goals are and once you have those goals it allows you to work towards them steadfastly you know you don't don't allow anything to throw you off your game or whatever just keep going know what the goals are as a collective and keep going until you achieve that goal um, so on the on day six we will be uh, you would be celebrating Kumba which is means creativity in Kiswahili and this is to do always as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it and then you have this, the beautiful symbol of creativity and this basically just means um, you know using what your skills and your talents and using that for good and using that for your community to better your community um, instead of just hoarding that knowledge or that creativity that you have or you know uh, you know a lot of people they're afraid to be themselves and 
is forth. And so when I'm when I'm in a room full of black people and they're saying I'm a I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a you know a musician, I'm you know I do this, I do that. I I'm like stunned at our excellence, like the black excellence in that room, like just of one group of people. Like it, it could be like maybe twenty people, and I'm like man, like if we have this much excellence this much brilliance in one room imagine what we could achieve if we um you know imagine what we could achieve if we all came together and then you have day seven which is imani it means faith and uh, most of you probably have heard of imani as michael imhotep mentioned because it is a lot of little girls are named imani i actually know an imani and it's just a beautiful name. Um, it believes to believe with all our heart and our people, our parents, our teachers and leaders and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. And I'm gonna tell you now, man, I I live on faith alone. Like it's just every day you wake up, you're fighting a good fight and you really sometimes just wanna walk away. I used to wanna walk away when I was in the beginning of it. I was so tired, you know, I was just like, man, these people are never gonna learn. <laughs> But, you know, as you go on, you start to see that change. You start to see people coming, waking up and rising and rising up against, you know, white supremacy and racism. And you're like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe this is going to work. Maybe, maybe this is going to happen. And you continue that faith uh, to keep you going, you know, when you really just want to give up. So this is, I think this is a great way to end the Kwanzaa celebration because it's the beginning of the new year. And this actually happens on uh, January 1st. So it's kind of like the new year. You're starting with Imani. And it's just awesome to kind of have that restored faith and focusing on celebrating a day of faith and moving into the new year with that renow renewed faith. Okay, so these are some books um, I found online and on the Kwanzaa official Kwanzaa website, Milana Karenga's website, and there's so many more out there, it's ridiculous, so, you know, but I just wanted to give you guys a few books to, to read, um, just to kind of learn more about Kwanzaa, and there's also, you know, some of these books are for children, so that you can teach them about Kwanzaa as well. Um, what is a Kwanzaa set? Uh, it's a central place in the home for the Kwanzaa set. The symbols of Kwanzaa is chosen. A table is then spread with a beautiful piece of African cloth. Then the mikeka is placed in this means mat. It's placed down and all of the other symbols are placed on it or immediately next to it to symbolize our rootedness, rootedness in our tradition. Next to Kanara, which is the candle holder, is placed on the mat and the Mishuma Saba, seven candles, are placed in the Kanara, which is the candle holder. And of course, you can add things. Um, it didn't mention the Unity Cup. I didn't see the Unity Cup on here anywhere. But I mean, you can add stuff. I would, you know, I, I do think you should have what the, the basics of this, the Kwanzaa set. But you can definitely add more things um, that are relating to like your ancestors and um, so here's an example of Kwanzaa set and you can see they're they're not exactly the same but they have some of the same quality um, care you know objects in them so you have the fruit uh, which symbolizes the harvest and then you have and it symbolizes life as well um, because fruit is living is coming from a, a tree or plant and then you have the unity cup you have the canara of the candles um, you see on in as I mentioned before early just now on the other slide you can see that they added like a little a little person it looks like a voodoo doll almost but voodoo is not bad actually voodooing is a religion um, practiced by Africans and of course everything that we have practiced or created, they try to deem it as bad so that we will move away from our heritage and our, our truth, but it's not a bad thing. Um, so they they seem to have wanted to add a, a, a doll to their Kwanzaa set, and then you have on one, they have the beautiful um, curtains behind it, and they also have like an African cloth on, on the one table to the left, but then on the right, they have like a mat. So 
it just shows how it can vary but it still has the core pieces to it um like the corn and the and the candles and the canara and such today is the start of kwanzaa celebrations around the world and for that we go to california where the holiday was first established by maulana karenga in 1966 Kwanzaa honors African heritage and celebrates family, community, and culture. It takes its name from the phrase Matunda Ya Kwanzaa, which in Swahili means first fruits. Kwanzaa's origin lies in the 1960s civil rights and black freedom movements and is a way of commemorating the African heritage of black Americans whose ethnic history was stripped away by the slave trade. It's a cultural rather than religious holiday and can be celebrated regardless of a person's faith or tradition. Joining us now is Keith Mays, author of Kwanzaa, Black Power and the Making of the African-American Holiday Tradition. Uh, thanks for joining us. I want to start by asking you, uh, perhaps we can clear up some of the misconceptions. Many people uh, believe that Kwanzaa is, is a replacement of sorts for Christmas, but that's not true, right? That is not true because in many ways when it was first created, it was part of the black freedom struggle that identified the American calendar as a site of struggle. So they did critique so-called white holidays. So in that sense, it is a critique of Christmas, but it was not created to replace Christmas. Most African-Americans historically are Christians. And so Maulana Karenga and the US organization were not trying to get people to to completely abdicate uh, Christmas as a celebration, as a holiday, as something that they understood was endemically tied to their identity as black folks, as Christians, black Christians. But it was meant to uh, sit alongside dominant holidays like Christmas. And there are other black holidays that sit alongside dominant holidays on the calendar. Calendar Kwanzaa was just, uh, was just one. So it was an alternative, but not a replacement. And you know, when we talk about where it's, it's most celebrated in the world, uh, what can you share with us about, about the details around that? Well, Kwanzaa did spread worldwide uh, when it was created in 1966. Immediately, 67, 68, it began to spread across the United States in cities that were mainly populated by African Americans, or well, the density of, of the black population was the greatest. So it spread to the Bay Area, it spread to cities like Chicago and New York and Atlanta. Uh, we had the largest numbers, but uh, by the time we get to the 80s and 90s, you can find Kwanzaa in places like Toronto, like Paris, uh, like uh, places in the Caribbean, even uh, places on the continent of Africa. Kwanzaa was, as you said, uh, was uh, created in 1966 in Los Angeles, California. It's not an African holiday in that sense, but you can find Kwanzaa pretty much anywhere in the world now. And, you know, when we talk about the, the significance of the colors that are used to celebrate Kwanzaa, black, red, and green, uh, what can you share with us about, about the specifics as to what, what those indicate, really, and what they symbolize? Well, the uh, black, red, and green flag, the flag was first created by Marcus Garvey to symbolize a black nation in the making. And it was a way, again, to, to sort of critique uh, American racism and discrimination and Jim Crow, so Marcus Garvey and the UNIA created the black, red, and green flag. Maulana Karenga and the US organization adopts that flag. It reorients some of the colors and it makes it part of the Kwanzaa celebration. So it's part of the symbols that are, that are part, what, what he calls a Kwanzaa set, which includes the calendar, uh, I'm sorry, which includes the candles, the kinara, the candle holder, the mat, uh, um, the cup and, other uh, ritual symbols. So it's just part of the, the Kwanzaa set. And you know, it, it's, it's funny, you know, people say, uh, you, know, no, you know, they use it kind of in pop culture and people might, you know, even say, how oh, you know, Merry Kwanzaa, Happy Kwanzaa, they might say the wrong thing. But, but when it comes to the actual uh, principles associated with Kwanzaa, a lot of people are left in the dark. I mean, how would you kind of sum it up in terms of the major celebrations and principles associated with it? Well, Kwanzaa has seven days associated with seven principles. And the principles range from uh, unity, which is emoji, self-determination, uh, kujichagalia, ujima, ujama. There are seven principles. Well, here, this was the beauty of the principles. Although they come out of the black freedom struggle, in many ways, the seven principles are not black principles. They can apply to any community. They can, they can apply to any situation. 
And in many ways, they are lifelong principles that all of us as human beings can live by. And in that sense, they are, they take on a quasi religious and biblical significance in that when you talk about faith, which is one of the principles, uh, when you talk about creativity, uh, these are not uh, endemic to uh, African Americans or any people of color, but they really have universal appeal. So that was his brilliance in 1966, and right. uh, I'm not quite sure if he understood that when he created it. And you know, we're looking at them again, you know, uh, and I think, you know, on a personal note, when I look at them, obviously you're right, on the right we see self-determination, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. But, but you know, as an Arab uh, American, I see the last one, faith, and you know, obviously Iman is the word in Arabic for faith, and, and it, it's, it's used here with the Imani. Uh, uh, for me, on a personal level, only goes to show you that you know, faith can even be well beyond religion. As we mentioned, this is more of a cultural holiday than a religious one, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, looking back, though, on, on 2013, I'm curious, what, what message of Kwanzaa, with, with, when it comes to you, resonates the most to you this year in particular? The principle or the, the understanding of Kwanzaa that resonates the most to me is just community. And that could be the community of, of your neighborhood. That could be, mean your family, as small as your family. It also can mean the national community in the as far as the United States. It's the worldwide community. Kwanzaa is a, a celebration. It's a ritual that, at its core, means bringing people together uh, in gathering other people. And so as we look uh, toward 2014, we should remember uh, what Kwanzaa is about, which is the fact that it brings a large amount of people together. And that's why it still resonates to this very day. It's 47 years old uh, today. All right, guys, so that was my presentation. Um, again, my name is Samantha Nisa Yerashalam L. And at this time, I am taking questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them as best that I can. If I can't answer your questions, I will take down your information and get back to you if you would like. And let's sh shoot out the questions. <laughs> Thanks for watching.